Hey everybody. Uh, I know that we're supposed to be doing Esther today, but I'm gonna change it up a little bit. And that's because today is not a regular Sunday. Today is a special Sunday. You know it's Easter. Uh, there's a lot that's, that, this, it's Easter. I mean, it's time to celebrate. This is, uh, in my opinion, the biggest Christian holiday, the biggest holiday um, of all of them. This is as important as it gets. This is as big as it gets. And I'm excited. And so because of that, I want to do a special Sunday morning Thrive. Uh, I'm probably going to post this so the whole church can have it just so, you know, it's available to everybody. But I think it's going to be really good today for us to look at uh, the events that led up to this morning. What happened on Easter morning is the most significant event of all time, um, especially in regards to us, because it's the reason that we get to have eternal life. And that's the reason to be excited. And so I want us to look at the week that leads up to Easter Sunday. And so to do that, I have lifted a, a diagram um, that, that's gonna put all of these events in a format that is kind of easy to follow, but can kind of be hard too. And so what we're gonna do this morning is you're gonna have this, we're gonna put it up on the screen so you can see it. Uh, our goal is, is that by the end of this morning, today, whenever you're done with this video, that you're gonna have a really good understanding of the events that led up to Easter, uh, why they're significant, when they happened. Uh, my personal hope is that you're gonna have a couple like aha moments when, oh, that's when that happened and, and these are how these things relate. And so I'm really excited to get started um, and we're gonna begin just right here at the beginning of this diagram. So right out of the gate, what you're going to notice is that there's a bunch of lines that look like they've just been randomly scribbled on a page that have words written everywhere and Bible references all over the place. And it can be kind of overwhelming at first. Don't worry, it's not. And once you understand uh, how this was designed and laid out and, and the thought that went into it, it's, it's going to make perfect sense and it's going to be really amazing. Now, so what you're going to see um, is all of these lines represent people or people groups. And so there's a line that represents Jesus. There's another one that represents uh, like the Jewish leaders at the temple. And there's gonna be other ones that's the disciples and they're gonna come and they're gonna go. And it's gonna depend on what part of the story that we're at that's gonna tell you this is where that group was. Now the lines aren't just scribbled. They're not just randomly placed on the page and spread apart for no reason. Uh, what, that, what those spaces between the lines mean is actual physical location. And so when two lines are next to each other or touching, uh, it means that they're actually together for an event. And when you see other lines break off and go to other places, it means that that group or, or that those people uh, went somewhere or they left or they're in some different place now. And so we're going to see right here at the beginning, we're going to have two disciples getting the cult. And you're going to recognize that um, as the event that comes right before Jesus's triumphal entry. And this is a big deal. There's a lot that, that the triumphal entry is telling us about the identity of Christ and who he is. And, and really what it boils down to is this, is that we know that Christ the Messiah, uh, he, he's reigning king, and he, he came to his capital city of Jerusalem, and he was greeted as such. Now, this was, this was the week leading up to Passover. There's going to be a lot of people in Jerusalem at this time, especially and notably, probably, a lot of the people that, that were not in Jerusalem before, but who are aware of or who actually have witnessed or been a part of Christ's ministry uh, north of Jerusalem. Uh, that would be in like Galilee and, and those areas. Uh, Jesus has, you know, kind of headquartered out of Capernaum sometimes. And so we're going to expect those people uh, to be in Jerusalem. And they're probably... Um, in, in my uh, opinion and research, those are probably a lot of the people that make up the crowd that is celebrating Christ. Um, as, and they're putting down the palm leaves as he's coming in, riding on the colt. Um, not as a conquering king, not as a warrior king. That would have been somebody on a horse. This, was, this is a ruling king who's sovereign, um, who's peaceful. And you're going to see that at the same time the crowd um, has gathered, that the Jewish leaders have also gathered. And that they're all in the same place. They're all witnessing Jesus come in. And so when Jesus comes in, uh, you're going to have that's happening on a, a Sunday. We're going we're gonna to go into Monday um, and Tuesday and Wednesday. And what, you, what you're going to see on, on this chart and what I hope that uh, you'll kind of see is, is the progression of how Holy Week is going to work. Uh, the crowd seems to kind of disperse. And so at the very beginning of, of this Holy Week, the Jewish leaders have seen Jesus. They've already been threatened by him because he's been welcomed as this king. 
they're going to go back to the temple. And now Jesus is going to cleanse the temple. Uh, you're going to recognize that as the story where Jesus expressed like righteous, rightful anger. And he flipped tables and he whipped people because they were, uh, they were disgracing the temple. That's his father's house. And that's where this story fits in is that it's right after um, or the day following the triumphal entry. Now, as we, as we continue further um, into the week, um, after the, the cleansing of the temple, you're going to have Jesus and his disciples leave the city. Uh, that's kind of common practice uh, when, you're, when you're in a place like this. It's not like cities are built the same way they are today, where there's a lot of open and available lodging for holidays, and there's big hotels with tons of rooms. Um, this is a different world, and so it's much more commonplace for you to exit the city walls uh, for your just living time. You know, you're going to rest, have dinner, have breakfast, go back to work. Uh, we're kind of seeing that pattern with Christ as they're returning. Uh, this, is, this is the point in time when Jesus sees the fig tree. And the fig tree is, is showing the world that it is in bloom. And it's doing that uh, by the leaves that it has out. It's, it's essentially broadcasting that the fig tree uh, should have fruit on its branches. And so when Jesus approaches the fig tree to get some of that, to have something to eat, uh, he sees that there's no fruit and he, he curses the tree. And later we're gonna see um, that that tree actually withered from the inside out. Now, that's the opposite of what we would normally expect. This is the core uh, went first and then the branches went second. You don't see trees wither that way. They always wither from the outside in. And so this is Jesus pointing at um, the fact that he's gonna be fixing the core of the problem. Now that tree is representative of something. Uh, and we're probably gonna get to that as Jesus goes into the city and you're going you're gonna to have him start to have discourse inside of the temple where the Jewish leaders are raising all of these arguments to him. And, and they're trying to start a debate. And they're trying to get Jesus to say something that, that, they, can, that they can kill him for, really. Uh, they want him out of the way. And so they're constantly fishing, giving him all of these questions. And what you'll notice is that that fig tree that had no leaf is representative of those Pharisees who had all of the gowns and did everything that the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and scribes and the rest of the Jewish uh, council, that they might have had all of these signs and symbols that they were bearing fruit, but the reality is, is that they weren't. And that Jesus was, was going to have an impact on them that was going to wither it from the inside out. Um, and, and that we'll see the temple collapse um, in 70 AD. Um, under Roman um, siege. And so there's, there's so much going on here. It's just a phenomenal amount of information uh, with how much Jesus is, is teaching. Uh, he's gonna have predictions of his, of his own death. And as we continue to go later into this week, we're gonna start getting into Wednesday. And this is where you're gonna see the lines start to make their first major changes. The, the line for the crowd is gonna be gone. And so as far as, as far as we are aware, the crowd that was there at the triumphal entry um, has dispersed. And for whatever reason, may, maybe it's influence from uh, the, the religious leadership at the time that was um, pushing for, for events to go a certain way. Maybe people just went home um, after following Jesus and, and celebrating his triumphal arrival. Uh, we don't know for sure, the Bible doesn't tell us for sure why the crowd is gone, but as far as we can tell just by reading the passages, they're not there showing their support for Christ anymore. You're also going to notice that Jesus and his disciples um, are starting to go their own way here on Wednesday and Thursday, and that the Jewish leadership is segregating themselves back uh, to kind of confer with each other on how they're going to deal with the problem that is Jesus, the man that's teaching um, love God, love people. Uh, those were what he said were the greatest commandments before this was happening, um, during his questioning when they were trying to pin him on something. And so they, they despised him, but Jesus was right. And they were setting about their, their course on how they were going to deal with this problem. Um, it's at this point you'll see that there's a new line that breaks off of the disciples, and that's going to be Judas. Um, he's going he's gonna to break apart from the disciples for a long enough period of time to confer with those Jewish leaders to make a decision about how Judas was going to participate in, in Christ being arrested. And that was a decision that Judas made, and, and there was the changing of money 
And Judas goes back to be with the disciples again. Although uh, you'll see that he keeps his own line and you know, he's kind of separated himself. It seems like he's already made that decision in his heart. Jesus is going to call him out pretty soon. Um, you're going to see that there's a couple more that are going to break off. And these are Peter and John as they go to prepare the upper room for Passover. And guys, Passover is a very, very, very important event um, in Jewish history, and, and it should be for Christians as well. Uh, we should consider uh, what Passover was, why it is critical, why it is important, because it's, it's no coincidence that Passover happened, and that's what Jesus was celebrating before he, he goes to the crucifixion. There's so much uh, for us to dig deep into. It's not the goal for today, but I definitely want you to see how, how these things are gonna start tying together. Um, so, so Peter and John break off to go prepare the upper room for the Passover meal. You guys are going to know that Passover meal by the name of the Last Supper. Um, it's, it's not just any other meal. It, it has significant history um, in, in modern uh, Jewish practices and Messianic Jewish practices. You actually participate in this meal where every item um, on, on the table has a very, very serious thing that it represents. Um, you'll have like bitter herbs that represent when it was bitter for the people to be in the desert, um, things like that. And so that's what they were doing at that table that night when Jesus was telling them, this is, this is my body, this is my blood, take and eat in remembrance. And, and we do that today in remembrance of him and of what is going to happen next. Because what happens next is, well, it's sad. Um, and and it, we, we shouldn't just, you know, read through these pages. We should recognize um, what's going to happen in the next um, really 72 hours or 48 hours. Um, it should grieve us even today. Like uh, I'm recording this on Saturday and this is the Saturday that I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so here we are at the Last Supper. The disciples are all gathered. Um, Judas is there. Jesus is there. The Jewish um, high leadership is waiting for Judas to return and guide them to Jesus. Now, while uh, Jesus is participating in the Last Supper with his disciples, he, he's going to call out Judas. Um, the one that dips this cup um, is the one who will betray me. And, and Judas leaves, and he, he goes to the Jewish leadership. Uh, what exactly he says right at this point in time, we don't know for sure, but um, there's, there's a little bit of a time gap because Jesus is going to eat uh, and finish the Last Supper, and then he's going to gather the 11 remaining disciples, and then he's going to leave um, to, to what we will call the Garden of Gethsemane. And you'll recognize that because that is where Jesus is praying. He hunkers down here in the Garden of Gethsemane. He tells his disciples to not fall asleep. So of course, they just immediately go to sleep um, on more than one occasion. And Jesus says about praying. And, and this, is, this is a really critical thing. I want you guys to, to hear me on this. Jesus prays for the cup to be taken from him. Guys, that's the cup of wrath. That's Old Testament kind of stuff. And, and that's going to be really important. I'm going to tell you why once we get to the crucifixion, about what that cup is and, and why it's more significant um, than, than sometimes we just kind of glaze over it. And so Jesus is making these prayers. And while he is doing that, uh, Judas shows up. And when he comes, it's not just him. He brings uh, the Jewish leaders. He brings the temple guard. That's going to be Jewish um, armed individuals um, whose normal role would be kind of like a, to police the temple, uh, but they, they are underneath the authority of the Jewish council. Now, a really important thing to note here is that there's no Roman involvement yet. And so the guards that come and the group that comes is, is Jewish, it's of Jewish descent and it's Jewish people. And so, so don't confuse those things um, because we're going to see the Roman involvement here in a little bit for Jesus' trials. And so Judas approaches Christ at the Garden of Gethsemane and he gives Jesus a kiss. Now he had already told the Pharisees and the Sadducees that the one that I give this kiss, and this is a, this is like a, this is like a phileo kiss. Um, this would be like a, a greeting kind of kiss for someone that you are very close with. Um, not, probably not too far removed from, I, I think it's the French that do the kiss on either cheek. You can correct me if I'm wrong in the videos. I, I can't, I'm just spacing on that. Um, so Judas does that. He only does it to Jesus. Uh, there's a response um, by uh, Peter, I believe. I'll have to check my notes. He cuts off the, the ear of one of um, the servants of the high priest. Um, and, and 
he does that with a knife that, as far as I can probably guess, he, he lifted from the table of the Last Supper and he kept with him. It wasn't probably like a big Roman sword he did it with. It was probably more like a food preparation item. Um, and so like that's, that's the extent to which Peter was ready to, to bear arms against the, the temple guard to protect Christ and to stand up uh, for the man that he believed was a Messiah. And he, he was ready to, to do it. And Jesus stopped him. Um, and he, he healed that ear and he accepted his arrest. I, I forgot to mention that right before um, those events, Peter had earlier informed, or Jesus had earlier informed Peter um, that Peter would deny Christ on three separate times before the rooster crows. And so that's going to be, it's going to come up. And so Jesus is arrested. He is dragged uh, back towards uh, where the, the Pharisees and Sadducees have been doing all of this planning and plotting all along the court. And he, Jesus has to undergo essentially three series of trials where he's questioned and he's questioned and he's questioned. Um, and he, he, he does a very, very good job of answering those questions. I mean, he does the perfect job. But, but really what it boils down to um, is that he is Christ the Messiah. And, and he was ridiculed and he was mocked um, and, and it was bad. And so during these trials, you're, you're going to see in, in multiple um, books of, or in multiple of the Gospels, Peter denies Christ three times. Uh, see, Peter, even though the, the other disciples had fled, and maybe, you know, they might have been close enough by to, to get news, Peter stayed close enough so that he, he had Jesus within his, his sight. He could see Christ. And, and while that was happening, and he was, he was kind of camped out, uh, there were some people, this was, this was going to be late at night, uh, really early in the morning. They said, hey, aren't you, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? And again, uh, you know, you got to be one. You have the same accent he has. And again, and, and Peter denies all three times. And as soon as he does that third denial, the rooster crows and Jesus makes eye contact with Peter, um, which has a profound impact on Peter. All right, guys, so Peter has rejoined the other disciples. Um, also, by this point in time, Judas has also committed suicide. And that is a heartbreaking thing. And it's, it's also sad that the very money that he accepted to betray Christ, he had returned to, to the Jewish um, council. And what I've done was, I mean, he, he had a response. And w when he returned it, um, he went and he hung himself. And, and they went and they bought the field he hung himself in. Guys, that's in fulfillment of prophecy. And so now that the Jewish council has decided that, that Christ must die, they don't get to make that call on, on just murdering somebody. Uh, they don't have enough freedom and liberty under the Roman government to point at somebody and say, hey, we're, we're just going to kill you. Uh, they have authority to do other things. They have some measure of responsibility and autonomy, uh, but under Roman government, they cannot um, issue a death sentence. And so what they do is they take Jesus, they take their charges, and they go to the Romans. This is when Jesus is going to be brought before Pilate. Um, Pilate is going to have a, a time when he questions Jesus, and he's going to find nothing wrong. He's going to find no fault, no nothing worthy or deserving of death. Um, in Christ and what his responses are and what he says and what he teaches, like he has no problem with Jesus. Uh, but he also finds out that Jesus isn't from Jerusalem proper. And so he, he brings in Herod, um, who's in Jerusalem at the time, um, who's kind of like the higher overseer um, over those areas I had mentioned that were a bit north um, and, and broader uh, that Jesus was performing his ministry in before. And Herod has the same response where, hey, I don't have to see why we should allow them to kill him. And so he sends him back to Pilate saying, hey, this is your problem now. And so what Pilate does is as the crowds are starting to gather um, on Friday morning and, and they are calling for, for the death of Christ, Pilate, who says there's nothing wrong with Jesus, like I don't, I don't track here, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, it's my custom that once a year, I will release one prisoner from the jails. And so I'm gonna make you an offer. I'm, I'm gonna view Jesus as one of those prisoners. And I also have this other guy named Barabbas. Uh, this is a known bad dude um, in every measure. And this is probably the kind of guy that when crowds gathered, um, he would just randomly stab people to incite fear. 
um, and, and, to, and to raise up crowds. That's, that's another whole topic, but Barabbas was definitely not um, somebody that the Jewish people would typically say, yeah, let him go. And so th this was special. Pilate picked him on purpose because he was trying to prove the point. You have a real bad guy you can leave in jail or you have a, a good guy that's not deserving of death that you can have your way with. And under the influence and kind of pushing um, of the Jewish leadership at the time who was threatened by, by Christ and, the, and how people were essentially um, flocking to follow Jesus instead of them, uh, they invoked and they kind of pushed that crowd to call for the release of Barabbas and call for punishment of Christ. And, and Pilate, he tries more and more to say that Jesus isn't worthy of death. Jesus is flogged um, to where the skin is off of his back. Now, there's, there's a lot of pain in that. And I, I'm not going to try to downplay what happens um, with Jesus physically, what happens to his body, because it is a, a brutal, brutal, painful, agonizing, horrible death that um, he's about to start to endure. But there's something that's going to happen on the cross that's going to reveal to us that there's more to the picture than meets the eye. Jesus carries the cross all the way out to Golgotha. It's going to be the, the place of his execution. And, and it is there that under the witness of John and, and Mary and the other women that were there um, and his mother, that, that Jesus is crucified um, ruthlessly by the Romans. And crucifixion is horrible. Uh, Jesus hangs on the cross until death. That's what crucifixion is, uh, to, to hang until death. They, they mock Jesus. Um, they, they brutalize him more. Um, they humiliate him physically. Uh, they, they, they took all of his clothes. Um, they, they put the sign above him on the cross that said King of the Jews to mock him. And that's, that's not new. They were doing that during the trial. Um, with the crown of thorns and the purple robe. They, they're trying everything they can to mock him, um, to one final humiliation after another before death, um, to just r really drive it in. Guys, crucifixion is terrible. And as Jesus is on the cross, there's gonna be the, the event where the sky goes dark. Now, as bad as the physical death of Christ and the suffering of that is, there cannot be enough said about the cup that Jesus was praying about in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that is the cup of God's wrath. The sky went dark. So the suffering that Jesus was enduring was by and beyond physically as bad as you can begin to imagine um, about breaking a person's body and their soul with it. Um, but you also have a spiritual element here that's the cup of God's wrath that is it's a big deal. And as Jesus is crucified under the witness of, of these people that love him and cherish him, um, when, he, when he does die on the cross, which you, know, you have the two on either side of him, uh, one who recognizes him for who he was and the other who didn't. And there's, there's a lot to be said about what happened that day on the crucifixion. Uh, but I wanna point out that when Jesus did die, the earthquake, the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. There's a massive spiritual event um, and, and when you have that much happening on that cross at that time, we can't even begin to fathom that. I, I can't imagine. I, I try to put myself in the shoes of one of the people that was there with John and, and Mary and, and just try to begin to perceive the magnitude of this event. And I, I never can feel like I truly grasp it all. And I probably never will. Uh, that's Good Friday. We call that day good. Good Friday. And the reason that we call that day good um, is because it was on the cross that sins were atoned for. As it is from the cross, the sacrifice that Christ made, that we can pass um, from here um, to into forgiveness. And guys, that's, that's pretty representative of Passover. When there was a sacrifice that, that the Jewish people in Egypt painted the door frames with uh, the lamb's blood so that um, the angel would pass over and their firstborns would live uh, to this. Guys, it's, it's blood for blood. And Jesus' blood is God's blood. It's enough for everybody at all time, no matter what. And so Jesus died on the cross. He, he's removed um, from the cross by Joseph of Arimathea. Um, Joseph of Arimathea 
was apparently had some money. Um, he had had his own kind of like grave prepared for him that that was just for him. Nobody else um, had ever decomposed there before. Like it was his new grave, um, and, and he wrapped Jesus's body in, in the finest stuff that he could do, and and he buried Christ himself. After the burial, uh, the women and Mary and John they they go back to the disciples. Uh, there's going to be a, a time of grieving. You would, we all grieve the loss of ones that we love. And, and this was a group of people that dearly, dearly loved Jesus, recognized him as the Messiah, and they grieve. Now, they don't go to the tomb on Saturday. They, they take the Sabbath. Now, whether they take the Sabbath to just purely honor the Sabbath, or because they're afraid of being caught by the Jewish leaders at the side of Christ, I can't tell you. Um, what I do know is that the Jewish leaders were able to influence Roman leadership uh, to post guards at the tomb of Christ because they knew that Jesus said that after three days he could rebuild the temple. They knew that there, were, um, that there was a belief that Jesus would come back on the third day and, and they made sure to guard that tomb. And so we're gonna count those days. You have Good Friday, Jesus died during the day. And so if you're, if you're doing your math here, that means that um, Jesus wasn't dead for 72 hours. He was dead for three days. He was dead on Friday because he died. Um, he was dead all day Saturday. And then we're going to see what happens here on Sunday morning. When you watch this video, it's going to be Sunday morning. That's exciting. Um, so they go and they honor the Sabbath. And then they, they probably are at the upper room or scattered. They, they might have had some level of confusion or uncertainty as to what was next. I mean, remember, when they left to follow Christ, they didn't know um, that this was how it was going to go down. They left their families. They left their jobs. They left everything. I mean, they left their savings accounts, some of them for years, to follow Christ. And so there's probably a, a certain level of unknown ahead of them. Uh, I, I don't know for sure whether they all stayed together all the time or what they were doing all of the time. But what we're going to have is, is a really fast series of events that's going to go down on Sunday morning. So after Saturday of nothing, um, of not even going to the tomb, of, of, of honoring the Sabbath, um, and probably mourning deeply. We're going to have Sunday morning come. It's this morning. Man, I'm excited for this morning. All right, so here we are. It's Sunday morning, finally Sunday morning. We have Mary and, and the women going to the tomb uh, to give honors. I mean, I mean they were going to do um, more preparations and, and to, to show respect and dignity um, to, to the body of Christ. And there's guards there, obviously. Now, when the women get there, there's, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. Uh, you have like the, the encounters with the angels inside the tomb, outside the tomb. You know, Jesus isn't here. Uh, the women leave and, and Jesus reveals himself to them. And th there's that shock. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Isn't this the greatest news there ever was? And the women, after Jesus um, departs, they run back to the disciples. They get John and Peter. They return to the tomb again. And it's shortly after that that Jesus is going to appear um, on the road to Emmaus. And so this is, this is after the resurrection. This is after um, he's revealed himself uh, to Mary and the women. He's going to reveal himself on the, on the road to Emmaus. And there's two of the disciples. Um, there's a conversation about who was Jesus, what was going on, like what's the big deal, like what's going to happen next. Um, and Jesus is there. And, and it takes them a little while, but they recognize him um, after the conversation has been carried on a little bit. And as soon as they do, Jesus is gone. Now, they go back um, and report all of these events. And so, so far, um, what we have is a couple of appearances of Christ. We have Mary, um, the women who have seen him. Um, we have their reports to Peter and John. We have all of the disciples gathered. Uh, we have these guys that were on the Emmaus Road gathered. Um, they're probably back in that same place, the upper room. That's kind of what they've been headquartering in since the Last Supper. This is an important place, um, at least for them. And wh while they are there discussing, is Jesus alive? Did he really come back? And Thomas makes some remarks. And we know Thomas as Doubting Thomas. This is the reason why we call Thomas Doubting Thomas. Um, he makes some remarks about, you know, Jesus isn't alive. You know, if he's alive, I will believe it when I put my hand in the holes in his hands and the hole in his side. 
and for the suffering that happened on the cross is evidence that, that he is back. And so Thomas makes that remark. Jesus shows up and, and he's there. We, we have these kind of like supernatural appearances of Christ um, as, as, he, as he does um, Jesus stuff, <laughs> revealing himself to all of these people. Now, he wasn't like a ghost or anything crazy like that. It was his physical body. He had brought himself back to life. And that's the revelation that the disciples have at this point. Um, in the upper room as Jesus has revealed himself to them. Jesus is fully God, fully man, fully flesh, fully back from the dead. So here's the important thing that I want you to take away on this Easter morning. On Good Friday, you have Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross paving our way for forgiveness. It is his blood that pays for all of it. That's his, that's his sacrifice that he's made available to all who believe in him. Next, we have that period of waiting of, of you know, hopefully you were able to, to pray and meditate on these things on Saturday or grieve even. Now on Sunday morning is the resurrection. Guys, this is important. This is when Jesus beat death. He didn't have someone else beat death for him. No one else brought him back to life. He did it himself. He conquered death. Guys, this is the message of the resurrection. Death is conquered. There is new life. There is eternal, everlasting life for you, for me, for anybody that's a Christ follower. And so on this Easter, celebrate the resurrection. Celebrate the new life. Uh, have a great Easter, guys. Thanks for joining me on this video. Um, if you're watching this on Easter, it's time to stop and go and celebrate with your family, with whoever you're with, um, to, to make some phone calls. Celebrate Easter. Guys, there is life. There is, there is the promise of Christ. There is, um, I mean, I, I get excited just about His greatest commandment. Love God, love people. I'm simplifying it, but you can track that. I hope you're tracking with me. Um, we get to do those things because of the forgiveness we have from the cross and because of the life we have eternal from the resurrection. So enjoy your Easter. Happy Easter. We'll do this again next year.